Postcolonialism Meets Economics aims to further the integration of social theory perspectives into economics. Its objective is to challenge both the conventional and alternative perspectives within economics by encouraging a radical reevaluation of its privileged status. Within the realm of social sciences, the book specifically emphasizes the importance of considering postcolonial viewpoints. Presenting a range of scholars who contribute to this theme, the editors Zain Alabdin and Cherishila underscore the dominant position that economics holds within the social sciences, along with its implications for colonial and postcolonial development. Economics wields influence through its impact on policy making. Directly affecting people's lives. This orientation towards policy and real world impact aligns economics with modernist tendencies, often sidelining post colonial perspectives. The book seeks to address this gap by promoting an engagement between economics and post colonial themes and issues. This intervention is considered valuable for both post colonial studies and economics. For postcolonial studies, it fills a gap in economic theorization, while for economics, it offers a new vantage point through the subaltern perspective. The ultimate goal is to introduce a critical approach to understanding economics that remains ethically and politically conscious of issues related to dominance and subordination. The first part of the book addresses the philosophical and ethical foundations of this interdisciplinary engagement. Zain Elabdin critically examines the non economic core of economics, shedding light on the ways European and modernist notions of history, culture, and knowledge are employed in ahistorical and value neutral ways within the discipline. This has implications for development discourse. Which often reinforces cultural assumptions of economic growth and industrial society as developmental goals for societies perceived as non modern. The engagement with post colonial themes in economics does not entail complete dismissal of the discipline, rather, it advocates for reshaping economics through counterdisciplinary work. Cherishila extends this analysis to encompass the material dimensions of the postcolonial condition, exploring how marginalized groups interact with economic and material structures. The subsequent section of the book delves into the relationship between the shaping of economics discourse and colonialism. Dimond examines Nassau Sr.'s travel writings, revealing how his academic voice served to advance colonial economic interests, rather than genuinely understand other countries. Grappard uses the Paris Exhibition of 1878 as a unique lens to explore the interplay between economic stages, colonialism, and the body politics unveiling the gender and race dimensions of colonial economic thought. Kalari similarly demonstrates how the modernist spirit defined the economic realm in ways specific to the colonial experience, excluding forms of knowledge beyond a Eurocentric view of rationality. Moving forward, the book's next section delves into contemporary economics discourse and the continued exceptional status accorded to the discipline. Medley and Carroll examine the role of the International Monetary Fund IMF, in promoting global capitalism and its impact on gendered laboring bodies, revealing how power manifests through institutions to silence the realities of economic struggles. Olmsted critiques feminist economists for perpetuating modernist representations of Muslim women, pointing out their failure to challenge dominant economic discourses modernist foundations. Call concludes this section by critiquing mainstream economics for its unquestioning acceptance of specific methods and its disregard for historical, cultural, and political nuances. Grubert, K. Atikin, and Danby make significant contributions to the final section of the book, 
by presenting three non-modernist economic analyses from a post-colonial perspective, Grubber delves into the formation of racial categories in the economic history of Latin America, revealing their fluidity as people shift between these categories. These shifts often correspond to changes in material conditions, highlighting the instability of social identity and the existence of cultural hybrids. Grobert argues that examining those who defy easy categorization allows for a deeper understanding of multiple hybrid identities and the underlying social processes, enriching economic historical analysis. Chaoticans focus on the postbellum southern United States, examines the contradictions of class subjectivity, within the dominant discourse of race. Employing Homi Babha's concept of ambivalence within the context of class, she explores the conflicting aspects of class subjectivity. She emphasizes that subjectivity is a formative process, and that grasping the dynamics of exploitative class relationships requires an understanding of ambivalence. Chaotican scrutinizes the class-race relationships through discussions of ambivalent desires, fears, and sexual relationships between plantation owners and workers, revealing how sexual desire reflects class subjectivity. She contends that acknowledging the interplay between different discourses is vital for class-transforming political endeavors, as avoiding this interaction leads to an essentialist treatment of class, ultimately doomed to fail. Dandy's concluding essay takes a distinct turn by considering the prospect of a post-colonial post-Keynesian discourse and its relevance in the contemporary world. His central argument emphasizes the need for a social ontology that doesn't segregate the economy from other facets of the social realm. He examines the formation of Keynesian institutions, particularly the state, in the post-World War II era. Danby illustrates how bounded economies were compartmentalized within modern nations as a means of representing and controlling power dynamics. The creation of the United Nations, Bretton Woods organizations, and accompanying rights discourse perpetuated the separation of the economy from other social spheres. This post-war framing of the world order and national sovereignty constructed a knowledge system that redefined modernity, portraying the economy and the economics discipline as constituents of a state normalizing modernity. Danby contends for an alternative approach that recognizes the negotiation and renegotiation of nations through each other, challenging the notion of constructing modern nation-states as isolated entities. This perspective calls for the inclusion of social institutions in economic analysis, given the ontological reality that various economies function as open systems, rather than isolated domains. The collection of essays undeniably challenges established disciplinary boundaries and theoretical perspectives in economics. A notable aspect of this book is the dialogue established between the main contributors and scholars from economics and postcolonial studies. While this exchange may serve as an initial step, inviting others to engage in similar intellectual endeavors, the absence of engagement with potentially sympathetic mainstream economists is conspicuous. Given that the mainstream has a substantial impact on policy formulation and development discourse, their perspective remains unexplored. Nevertheless, despite these considerations, the book's merit lies in its potential to stimulate discussions within political economy and development courses.